Rejoice, heavenly powers, sing choirs of angels, exalt all creation around God's throne. Jesus Christ, our King, is risen. Sound the trumpet of salvation. Rejoice, O earth, in shining splendor, radiant in the brightness of your King. Christ has conquered, glory fills you. Darkness vanishes forever. And the song goes on and on. It's one of the most ancient that we have in the church, stemming from at least the third or the fourth century. It's called the Easter Exalted. Exalt, rejoice, heavenly powers. I'm told that in the first 600 years of the church's existence, People would fast for 40 hours before the dawning sun on Easter morning. No water, no food for 40 hours. And then on the angelic night, on Holy Saturday, after sundown, they gathered together and lit a great fire. And they would sing the exalted. And then they would take part of that fire to their homes. And throughout the night, these families in their home churches would tell all of the great stories of salvation history until finally it culminated with the rising sun. And that's when they would tell the story of Jesus and how through his life and his death and his resurrection, he wed heaven and earth. That in and through him, we all get to share in God's life and love for all eternity. 2,000 years later, we do the same thing. After the exalted pierces through the darkness of Holy Saturday evening, we too hear the first words of salvation history. And it starts with these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens, and the earth. The very first image that we have of God is God Creator. Later in the same story, we hear human beings are made in God's image and likeness. That means that we are called to the great honor of being creators with God. Even in times of uncertainty, chaos, distress, which we all know so well, we can create. The images of creation and new creation are all around us. As an Easter people, we are a new body called to participate in the work of renewal. And as my childhood pastor once said, it's an invitation with an expectation of participation. And with that, I want to formally welcome you to this interactive art retreat. It's a simple format with a simple sequence that is repeated throughout. First, there will be a scripture reading from each day of creation, followed by a drawing experience, followed by a meditation on that particular day. The drawing experience is meant to be interactive, so I encourage you, Grab some paper, pencils, pens, colored pencils, crayons, whatever you have, and to follow along. You don't have to be a great artist. If sketches don't look quite the same as the ones in the booklet or on the screen, no worries. It's all good. And speaking of, there's a sketchbook that we've created for you, which you can access and use through the link provided. The whole retreat is about an hour long but feel free to break it up in chunks and proceed at your leisure. I'll leave that up to you and the Holy Spirit. So now I invite you to begin this retreat in prayer. All powerful and ever living God, you created a creator 
when you imagined us into existence. Breathe on us the breath of life. Pour out ideas and insights. Let us be committed to you and the world you hold dear. To work for justice and find in it a deep sense of joy. O merciful creator, flow through us. Give us faith to see things not yet seen, a hope that overflows and a love that frees. O divine imagination, how wonderful are the works of your hand. In your generosity, bless our imagination. It lets us dream. Infuse our work with your spirit for your greater glory. Amen. Peace to you all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that light was good, and he separated light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day.
the first day, creation's first light, first morning, first dawn. Artists know that to see anything, our eyes first need to process light. When light hits our eyes, it brings in information about our created world. It's the primary source of every image. Consider this. Spirituality is, in large part, about learning to welcome light into our lives. Or as the Jesuit Anthony de Mello put it, spirituality is about waking up. Many people, he suggests, go about their lives in darkness. They're asleep, and they don't even know it. They're born asleep, live asleep, pursue careers, marry, have children, retire, and eventually pass away without ever waking up to the beauty and the truth around them. Light, the first divine gift of creation. And it's the light of faith that helps us wake up. We may resist, for while light makes us aware of all the beauty that there is to know, it also reveals places in our lives still left in shadow and darkness. In each of us, there is light and there is darkness. Our lives are a palette of various shades. But our spiritual journey begins with the gift of light. That thing by which we see what there is to be seen. Light. That energy that stimulates sight, enables vision. That illuminating force that reveals all that is hidden. And how good it is. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning and the second day.
The second day, creation begins to take form. Spirituality does not offer sudden and final jolts of perfect realization. If it's about waking up, well, then that implies a gradual process. Imagine a newborn baby. A newborn can be awake with eyes wide open, yet its vision is by no means fully developed. In fact, newborns see little more than the difference between light and dark. It takes time to learn to see. The process is gradual. Day by day, their vision develops. Those first couple of weeks, they can't see much beyond a couple of inches. But slowly, their focus intensifies. Their perception grows keener. And finally, forms and shapes and dimensions, they become ever more discernible. So too in the spirituality of the second day. Out of the hazy, amorphous shade of our experiences, shapes and dimensions begin to emerge. Day by day, our awareness increases. With time, our longings and desires, our thoughts and experiences, our fears and our anxieties, our questions and our answers, take on new, exciting, and sometimes terrifying composition. As our vision grows more acute, we eventually come to know that matter is graced, that shapes are sacramental, that forms are an outward expression of inner meaning, and how good it is. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, there was morning the third day.
the third day, creation's first day of organic life, many, diverse, and colorful. Imagine for a moment the world without color, a flower, your wardrobe, your food, the face of your loved one. Maybe you'll recall scenes from The Wizard of Oz or Pleasantville. Without color, how would the world be different? The more one thinks of it, the more color seems absolutely unnecessary. There is no reason God needed the world to be so colorful. And yet it is. Color, we discover, is a language unto itself. It adds to the contrast and complexity of the world. It represents variety and diversity, pleasure, emotion, choice. Color is a pure, gratuitous gift of God. A God who speaks to us and energizes us and manifests his care with such beautiful generosity. And how good it is. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, there was morning the fourth day.
The fourth day, creation within time and space. Artists employ the principles of rhythm and movement in their work to convey a sense of time and space. Rhythm is the repetition of elements with intentional regularity. Artists include sequences of objects in their works, and this mimics the beat of music, the flow of a dance. Movement is the path the viewer's eye takes throughout the artwork, portraying the passage of time. The continual rising and setting of sun and moon remind us that we are creatures who exist within time and space. Each of us is on a journey from toward. We are pilgrims. We have a past and we have a present and we have a future. The ancient Israelites fell into spiritual distress when they failed to remember the promises and gifts that had been given them. And we are not immune to this in our own day. Without reflection of what has come before, it is difficult to turn toward the future with any orienting sense of hope and purpose. Living as time and space bound creatures it smacks us with the reality. Our existence is limited and finite. Because of this, we are continually faced with a choice. We don't have forever to make up our minds about whether or not to accept God's invitation to fullness and union. Each day, God grants us the freedom to continue our pilgrim journey. Each day, God moves into our lives and invites us to see more clearly and to love more dearly and to follow more nearly. And how good it is.
And God said, Let the waters bring forth throngs of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters teem and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, there was morning, the fifth day.
The fifth day, the texture of creation intensifies. Along with other elements of art and design, texture possesses its own secret language. It evokes emotions and it offers subtle messages. We call to mind the smooth wood grain surface of our dining room tables, the oak pews of our churches. We know the furry softness of petting our dog or our cat after a long day of work their tongues as they lap across our face in gestures of happy affection. We recall the scent of a loved one, their favorite perfume, the smell of holiday parties. We appreciate the taste of morning coffee. We see the face of our best friend and we hear their laughter intertwining with our own. Consider this, all that we see and hear and smell and taste and touch. These are the very elements that give life a joyful and exciting texture. We give gratitude for our God-given senses because they're just another way that God communicates God's self to us and how good it is. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and of all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day.
the sixth day, created in God's image. What is it about the human face? The human face is arguably the most difficult subject to represent for an artist. It's been the source of fascination since the first Stone Age cave paintings and has been reinterpreted in various styles throughout history. Faces play an important role in social life, psychology, evolution, and religion. Sometimes referred to as the organ of emotions, our faces are a dynamic canvas where our affects are drawn vividly, then suddenly erased only to be redrawn in a new expression an instant later. Our identity is captured by its features and our eyes reveal important truths. In ancient Mesopotamia, people carved votive statues of various sizes. They depicted men and women with large, prominent eyes, usually with hands clasped right over left at the chest or the waist in a gesture of patient attentiveness. These ancient peoples brought these statues and left them in the temple, thus erecting a personal representation in eternal prayer before the gods, an act that signified that the spirit of the worshiper was present even when their physical body was not. The face of the worshiper turned eternally toward God. The face of God eternally turned toward the worshiper. This is as true a Christian image as there is. Christian spirituality is about learning to ever seek the face of the Lord. Intimate, loving relationship with God and others. How good it is. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from the work he had done in creation.
The Seventh Day, Sabbath. Representational art depicts objects as you see them. It's about getting an as realistic as possible rendering of the external world. Artists of the abstract, however, are not about making perfect copies of things. Instead, they seek to communicate in ways that reach beyond normal conceptualizations. Abstract art is about exploration. On the seventh day, God, the creator ex nihilo, the first abstract artist, stays her creative process. This is a day for God's beloved creatures to rejoice and simply be in the vast beauty that surrounds them. It's also a time to attend the reality that God is, like abstract art, always beyond our everyday idea of things. In the pause of the seventh day, we paradoxically come to notice the restlessness that accompanies our lives on this side of eternity. We come to see that our deepest desires for ourselves and for the world transcend present identification. Abstract art is a symbol that helps us celebrate the mystery of God and the mystery of who we are. Sabbath rest does not terminate in a peaceful satisfaction that accompanies a work complete. But rather, Sabbath rest is the rest that comes when we finally, once and for all, acknowledge, accept, and celebrate that God can never be fully or completely grasped. Sabbath rest is what comes when we finally let God be God and others themselves. It's when we allow God's incomprehensibility to become the very object of our blissful love. And how good it was, and is, and ever shall be.